Hello, welcome everybody to today's Appian Community Webinar. The topic of today's webinar is migrating your existing Power Builder application to the web using the Appian web product. Today's community presenters, Alex Linos and John Travisano, are from NextGen Public Safety Solutions, a software vendor based in Connecticut who have been working with Power Builder all the way back to the 2.0 days. Now, before we begin today's presentation, I wanted to just put up a brief disclaimer and remind you that today's presentation is, in fact, a, a community presentation. This is not authored by Appian, and the views expressed here are completely of the authors, independent of Appian. You're going to see in today's presentation possibly some links to some third-party uh, frameworks, software, uh, or other sites. Just please keep in mind that these uh, third-party materials are not provided by Appian, and so you should carefully evaluate it and decide for yourself whether you will uh, use that on your project or not. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over now to Alex and John. Hi, this is Alex. I want to uh, briefly go over our webinar agenda. Um, we're going to talk about our application dead end, um, how we tried to convert our application the first time and failed. Um, we're going to give you a brief cost analysis where we weighed out our options on how to uh, migrate our application. And we're going to give you a little bit on how we um, did a time frame for our changes from um, Power Builder to Appian Web. And then we're going to talk about the browser web plugin versus IWA, the installable web app in Appian Web. And then we're going to give you a demo of a uh, cool trick we have uh, in Power Builder and some source code around that um, for you to use in your applications. And then we'll also do a Q&A at the end. Hello, I'm John Travisano. I'm the lead developer with NextGen. I've been programming in PAL Builder for about 15 years. We also work with the .NET and our back end is within SQL Server. Um, I've worked on numerous projects throughout the state of Connecticut and Massachusetts. Um, we listed a few there and I will be focusing in on the end of the presentation with the demo code and the INI trick we came up with. And again, I'm Alex Linos. I am a uh, network engineer at NextGen Public Safety. I specialize in networking, virtualization, and I bring a uh, unique perspective because we also manage several of our clients' IT infrastructure. Um, and I'm presenting the boots on the ground perspective um, versus the how it works on my machine perspective. Um, and you know, if anyone wants to follow up with me with any technical questions, I would be more than happy to assist you with that. Um, NextGen Public Safety Solutions is a um, CAD RMS vendor in the state of Connecticut. What is CAD and RMS? Um, Computer-aided dispatching is what, what a dispatcher does when you dial 911. They geocode your location. They take in um, data from the 911 system and uh, dispatch emergency personnel to your location. Um, we interface with several systems from 911 systems to um, systems that alert fire, police, and EMS personnel to uh, your location. Um, we work over 4G LTE modems in police and fire apparatus. Um, we also have an iOS app uh, that is native that we have written for um, first responders. Um, we do report management solutions. Um, and basically anything and everything to run a um, public safety department. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we have an application where we know 
it's coming to the end of its life cycle. It's a thick client application on a laptop that was developed to work offline because at the time the technology was 2G modems. So it was designed limited future feature editions and we found out that it has a high cost to support it. So what ends up happening is a lot of Band-Aid fixes are being applied to this application. So we knew at some point this application was going to end. So we had heard of Appian Web uh, back early in 20, I want to say middle of 2014. Um, and we got a demo uh, thinking it was a solution to all our issues. At the time, we were struggling with um, native iOS development and easier deployments and um, being you know, power builder developers, our, our developers here thought they could do it all. Um, and they tried to make an application that did everything and shoehorn it into one size fits all. And unfortunately, that didn't work. Um, we started making changes with no clear motivation for the changes we were making. Um, <clears throat> but that changed for us uh, because we had to do a rewrite to a Connecticut accident report. And while we were doing this rewrite, we made a pretty intuitive step-by-step um, -step question type um, interface to um, create the accident report and to generate it. So from there, um, you know, our motivations changed. So at that point, we did a cost analysis to see if Appian Web was going to be a cost-effective solution versus hiring a full-time developer to maintain this application that has a dead end approaching. Um, we have two code sets, one for that application on the laptops and one for what we call the main system. And the main system is where that new accident report was developed. We really did not want to go into redesigning the databases on the laptops for the future releases, and we did not want to maintain two code sets. So Appian Web allowed us to maintain one code set with the current staffing we have. So overall, we would be saving money and time by switching to Appian Web. So the next phase was to jump into converting the code set. And yes, it took months to convert everything, but it's worth every minute. We also had help from Chris Pollock's examples. Um, that kind of slingshotted us forward when we hit some brick walls. And it was also the perfect time to replace legacy code. As Armin said, we were were we on Power Builder 2.0 at the beginning, so there was some legacy code that needed to be ripped out and updated. And we also had EA Server, so at the same time, we took EA Server out and switched to IIS. Having um, now successfully converted our application, we started to deploy it to our clients. Um, in deploying it to um, our clients, each client is kind of their own island of themselves. Um, we were dealing with multiple laptops with multiple browsers and, and different operating systems. Um, and when we started, we were having a lot of trouble with the IWA, um, or I'm sorry, the original web plugin versus IWA. Um, our windows were resized to fit a 1024 by 768 screen, which is common for police vehicles. Um, and having the browser window around it really was difficult. We had to come up with like full screen hacks and little scripts to make things work 
And um, it was a little painful for a while. But then when IWA came out, we flew through upgrading all our clients to Appian Web 2016 because of how seamless IWA made installing our application. In so much as me having to dedicate technical resources to it, our clients were now able to click on the link, install the IWA runner, and the application would open seamlessly just like the application they're using inside. Um, and for them, they loved it because there was no need to retrain their personnel. The install was so easy that even the users could do it. And everybody has had positive feedback on IWA and we've migrated all of our customers to that, to that product. So um, we're really big fans of it here. Um, now we had some useful solutions that helped us with our conversion um, that we wouldn't have been able to complete without the use of. We used Pebble Peeper to kind of remove some um, old legacy code and um, the variables that were being instantiated but not used. There was a lot of things it was showing us that we were doing that had just been there because it was legacy and, and it had been removed, not used, commented out, and it still was lying around. So Pibble Peeper helped us clean up our code. And then we moved to using um, WizSource by Top, Top Wiz by Roland, which is um, what we use for our source control, and that made managing um, a single source application um, easier for our developers. We've now even added a junior developer and uh, it's been easy to train them up on how to check in and check out objects. And uh, we moved a lot of our build to um, what I call like the arbiter of the builds, our, our virtual machine, which does all the builds. So that, that'll pull in the individual pieces from our developers and give us a nice stable build that then goes to QA, QC. Um, but one of our more useful solutions is we had to find a way to dynamically change the INI on an Appian web client. What am I talking about? Well, in traditional Power Builder development, everything pretty much lives in the INI. Um, your database settings, your application settings, um, your favorite sweatshirt, everything is in the INI file. So how do you do that when your INI lives not really on the client? It lives out on your um, Appian AEM installation and then it pulls it down, but it's sort of there, it's sort of not there. Um, <clears throat> so we had to find a way to modify the INI on the client as the application loads. Why is this important to us? Well, it's the same application that is a thick client inside the office now that has to be used in a mobile environment outside on a laptop or a tablet. So we had to be able to modify that on the fly. Um, and we used a pretty cool trick to do it. And we're going to go ahead and demo that for you today. Uh, all right, so as Alex was saying, we needed to be able to turn features on and off. So as you can see, that's the standard INI file that we all love. And then what we did was we started making database tables that represented the same sections and values as and I and I, so that when the application opened up, we could read the data out of the table and update the I and I files. But then we needed to go down all the way to a machine level. So by doing that, we added another database table and added a computer name to it with all the same sections, values, and keys. So this allows us to merge these two tables together an update an INI file all the way down to a machine level setting. So now we're going to get into 
the table structure. So this was the table structure we came up with for the main settings. So you could see you have the section key and value, and then we put a little description column in there so the developers can explain what this setting does to the technicians who will be setting this value within the database. And then you can see on the machine table, the only difference is the computer name has been added. All the other sections are the same. And then to merge the two tables together, we came up with a SQL procedure, pretty simple, and all you had to do was pass the computer name into it. And since we are in a SQL database, it's short and sweet, not too complicated. Um, I'm assuming you could do this in Oracle and other databases out there. So now we just want to show you some of the source code and some of the tables within SQL that we use. So on the left here, you can see we have the table for the main INI. So I'm just going to enter in a section, the key value, and the value. And then on the right here, you can see that the code is very, very simple. We have a data window here that is calling that stored procedure. And then all you have to do is loop through it and pass in your section key and value into the set profile string. So we're going to open up the INI file. And you can see we do not have an application name section yet, or the key, I should say. So now it retrieves right here. And then we just hit update INI. And now you see that the name equals hello. And since we added this to the main INI table, this will go out to every single machine. But say you didn't want that on this specific machine. What you can do is you can override that setting in here. Now when we run, you'll see that now it says buy. And then we can update the INI file. And now it says buy just for this one machine. And as Alex was explaining how the INI within IWA and the web plugin for Affion, it doesn't exist in a folder where you can just have a user go in to the C application folder, open the INI, set it, make it read only so it never changes. This way now a technician can control all your INI files within your whole application on all the machines from one location. So we found this to be very useful in saving time and frustration and troubleshooting to make sure all the machines were configured the same. So um, I know this is probably one of the shorter presentations, but I think we are ready for questions and answers. Great. Thanks, uh, Alex and John. Really appreciate that. Um, let's turn it over to the audience now. Please go ahead and type any technical questions you have inside the chat console, or I mean the question console of the uh, webinar uh, program. And Alex, John, and myself would be happy to answer those for you. Thanks, everybody, for joining. And please uh, give us your comments so we can continue to improve these uh, webinar series that we run. And also, feel free to join the uh, Appion community at community.appion.com. There's forms, tech articles, and uh, we have regularly scheduled technical webinars just like the one you attended today. So thanks everybody for joining and have a good day. Thanks Alex and John for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you.